We don't have to turn to our history books for heroes. They're all around us. One who sits among you here tonight epitomized that heroism at the end of the longest imprisonment ever inflicted on men of our armed forces. Who will ever forget that night when we waited for television to bring us the scene of that first plane landing at Clark Field in the Philippines, bringing our POWs home? The plane door opened, and Jeremiah Denton came slowly down the ramp. He caught sight of our flag, saluted it, said, God bless America, and then thanked us for bringing him home. Welcome back to the World Over. Admiral Jeremiah Denton was shot down by the North Vietnamese in 1965. He spent nearly eight years as a captive in the notorious Hanoi Hilton. He famously blinked the word torture in Morse code during an orchestrated propaganda broadcast in 1966. He, as much as anyone else, exemplified the bravery, heroism, and sacrifice shown by American POWs during the Vietnam War. I sat down with him a few years ago at our Birmingham studios to talk about what being a soldier meant to him and the faith that was crucial to his survival. Here's my interview with the late Rear Admiral and former Senator Jeremiah Denton. Admiral, to begin 1965, I want to take you back to Vietnam. You're shot down, you land in a river, and they begin fishing you out. What is going through your mind at that moment? Anger, frustration. But before we start, I have to say, all this hero stuff, the only hero of my story is Jesus Christ, not me, okay? Okay. Well, we will definitely get to that as well. Yeah. When, when, when you're in there, when, you're, when they're fishing you out, you're angry, and then they take you and they confine you. They begin to imprison you. What was that like? Well, uh, at, at, from there, they took me uh, blindfolded back to Hanoi, put me in a prison. And what was it like? Uh, it's a disorientation. You, you first start fearing you're going to lose track of time, and you mm -hmm. start making uh, calendars on the wall like the mythical prisoners do. Yeah. And then uh, you learn that Sunday's come and it's quiet and you're able to keep track of time. And you're very conscious that you better know the day because you're going to be accountable later when you get home for what happened. Hmm. And suddenly time and events per time mean a tremendous amount. That's one of the first impressions. Hmm. Then when you settle down and r realize what your condition is, you, the next thing that comes in is fear. They're going to torture you for military information or right. for propaganda stuff. When I was shot down, they weren't torturing, but we were scared they were. They, mm -hmm. they would put a gun to your head and say, uh, uh, tell us so-and-so or we're going to shoot. And I'd say, well, shoot, and it'd click. And it, but we thought that they might uh, start doing it for real, which mm -hmm. they did in October of that year. And then it was quite a, quite a ride from then on. What were they after? I know they, they wanted biographies, confessions. What were those designed for? Right. Um, the, the search for military information was not uh, conventional as in wartime. Mm -hmm. uh, it, for the Japanese and Germans in certain situations it may have been, but for us they knew we didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. uh, the plans were being, when I was shut down, were being made in the White House virtually. Right. And uh, nobody knew, no General Admiral knew what was going to happen the next day. So why? You, that's one thing they'd like to know. Mm -hmm. So, and the weaponry, uh, it didn't matter much to them. They, they couldn't do anything about what we had, so right. they weren't after that. Their strategy and their determination was to bend us to be used, break us to be used for propaganda, because their whole strategy of the war was to go through a few little military, military dilatory diversions and win the war back in Washington, New York, in mm -hmm. Chicago, and in co college campuses. And so we were to be broken and, and, and to uh, advocate their side in the war. That was their principal objective. Mm -hmm. In that, they, I think, lost that war. They managed to get a few guys uh, to do that, but uh, uh, most of us uh, didn't give them anything credible in that, mm -hmm. in that respect. You all, you all used to come up with fictitious biographies and that sort of thing to pacify yeah. them and to get out. Yeah, and they, they, we'd make them torturous for that. And to say to unconsciousness, you know, you can't be tortured any further than that. Mm -hmm. Or pull a guy's arms out of socket, and then he'd give him a biography, and it would be absurd. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I had a particularly flamboyant one I would like to see printed on New York Times, and I made them torture me every time they got it. Mm -hmm. 
but um, it was like that. <coughs> what what sort of torture were, were, were they were they doing Almost in the beginning? Almost different. Uh, well, mostly the rope tricks by which they would um, bind you up in ropes, cut off the blood circulation, which sounds nothing, but uh, pretty soon your heart's pounding so hard trying to send blood through your uh, body uh, that you can hear it pounding and you pass out after. Mm. And then they, 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 uh, maybe the first time that happens to you, you break it and give them a biography or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But after you can take it and pass out, maybe fast a little bit and get real weak, uh, that doesn't work too well. It, it was hard for them. Uh, but men are subject to different levels of pain that they can take, you know. And you were very resolute that you weren't going to give them certainly any military secrets. And the, the, you, you even stashed a little piece of glass in your cell. Why did you do that? Yeah, I'm a little uh, discomfited. I think they've said something in the code about you resist until uh, the point of no return. I, 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 but, I mean, but, but, but there's a weak part in there, I still think. I, I wasn't able to go to that debriefing. Mm -hmm. I was asked, but I couldn't. I was uh, doing something else. But I don't think that we should uh, forget that if you give classified military information, particularly sensitive, that you know about, uh, such as uh, ECM, where you turn it, when you turn mm -hmm. it on, how you turn it on, uh, you can cost the lives of other men, many men. So you gotta think about uh, whether you ever, ever sh should do that. Shouldn't that be an absolute rule that to the point of ultimate uh, will or re resistance, you mm -hmm. don't give uh, classified military information. I intended not to, and I had blo um, broken glass in my cell and in case they started. They, they, they give you plenty of days to make up your mind. They mm -hmm. threaten you before. If they gotten on that tack, I would have cut my wrists. Hmm. Tell me about, the, there was a rig they instituted in your cell for there five There were so days. many rigs, it's kind of complicated. The one you're talking right. about is when I surrendered to right. God. Yeah. yeah. It was, it's kind of hard to describe. Um, I didn't, I was down to about 120 pounds at that point. I didn't have any meat on my butt, so I was sitting on this concrete bed with my ankles in stocks and my hands uh, handcuffed behind me in what they called hell cuffs, which is very painful. A, a gag in my mouth and, and blindfolded. And they had a rig uh, under my ankles, under my Achilles tendons was a bar which they could pull on from above on a pulley and push it into my mm. Achilles tendons and it couldn't go anywhere because my legs are in irons right. on the top. Right. And uh, So it would just eat away at the Achilles tendon eventually. Right. They got almost halfway through mine. Uh, mm. The first, I surrendered after five days and nights thinking that they would uh, accept some bland lie, uh, some truths they already knew. They wanted to know what our camp communications was. I was a camp commander. If we mm -hmm. had lost those communications, they were very complex, countermeasure, countermeasure type thing we've been working on for a long time. We were heavily relying on it for morale and, and order and discipline. Right. The chain of command. I wasn't about to give it. But I said, bow cow, I surrendered. They took me in and I, I wrote a bunch of stuff they already knew. And I thought, well, they're going to let me go because they don't want me to die. That was the key. Mm -hmm. You had to convince them that your life, uh, they had to take your life. They didn't want to kill us. They wanted to save us and exploit us. Mm -hmm. So to my surprise and dismay, they put me back in the rig. Mm. And uh, it got pretty hopeless. I couldn't think. I couldn't pray and, uh, anymore. And I said to God, it, it's not easy to say, say, expressed with my whole being, I can't think of anything else to pray. I can't think of any recited prayers. I can't think of any spontaneous prayers. Uh, I'm in a desperate situation. If anything happens good out of this, it's going to be yours. You got it. You got me. You got everything about me. Hmm. The instant I said that, I had been going through alternating periods of feeling uh, heat and feeling uh, chills. I was shaking at that time, and you could hear my uh, chains around the camp. And the instant I willed that, it was like a blanket of warmth, uh, just a whole aura of composure, of no pain. The pain was immediate release, which was in my back. That was a principal part of the pain. And I just went from uh, fear, anxiety, uh, almost an unendurable pain, uh, to complete comfort and assurance and mm -hmm. no fear. 
A few minutes later, the guard came in, the camp commander, this is the only time I know that this happened, the camp commander himself came, a guy we call the lump, he was a pretty senior <laughs> guy. He uh, came with the two guards and told him to go in there and uh, break that and break his legs if you have to, but break him. Mm -hmm. And he was screaming, uh, he was screaming at them. They came in and one of the boys was about 19 years old, pretty good kid, we called him Smiley, he did his duty, he tortured, but I don't think he liked it. At any rate, he and the other guard started pulling on his pulley mm -hmm. and I just looked at Smiley with a smile uh, expressing what was in me. I, I don't um, mm. hurt, uh, you're not gonna break me, and you're not a bad guy. How can you do this to another human being? Mm. His face broke, contorted, tears. He yanked the other guard off the, the pulley and went outside and started screaming at the camp commander. He wasn't gonna do that anymore. They're gonna have to find somebody else. Huh. And 20 minutes later, they came in and uh, put sulfa on my open wounds, released the rig, and uh, carried me out to a uh, a, a, an isolated place where I supposedly couldn't tell the other guys I hadn't given in. Your faith and your honor That really, was a miracle to me. Yeah. Your faith and your honor really fused in that experience, in, in all your experience in this I time. I don't know why you throw an honor in there, but faith, yes. Uh, faith, uh, that was the most uh, terrific product of a prayer, uh, of, of an answer to a prayer that I ever gotten. Mm -hmm. But all the way through prison, it was like that. They mm -hmm. say, you know, Anybody in pain or suffering is going to pray. No atheists in foxholes. Some woman uh, with a difficult um, delivery. They're going to pray and they're going to get relief of some kind. God's going to help them in some way. Right. And we had so many examples of that because we were under such constant pressure and pain and suffering and fear that we prayed a lot and we got a lot of answers and there's nothing new about that. It's throughout the history of the world and in most everybody's lives. And so I don't like to be, you know, praised for receiving grace from God. You always do. But you cooperated with it. And oh, you understood it when yeah. it was going on. And some people don't. They waste that suffering. They waste that pain. Well, you say? I don't know about that. But I, I yeah, sure. You, I, I think most people cooperate when they're in pain and they're getting help. Admiral, at this point, uh, tell me how freedom, what freedom means to you after this experience and faith mm. and, and how they're really bound in your mind. Well, before the experience, intensely during the experience, and intensely after the experience, I've devoted a lot of thought to the relationship between faith and freedom. Mm -hmm. If you go back to Athens, the first time democracy was really tried, and darn near the last, because the next time it was um, Switzerland, and they didn't really complete their democracy uh, the way we did, but in, in, in Athens, it failed. It became a classic example which indicated to the political world, the political science world, that democracy won't work. Sooner or later, uh, the people just can't handle it. They, they get uh, to the point where demagogues, which is a word that came in then, mm -hmm. can, mm -hmm. knowing that they all have special interests, can uh, demagogically talk to them, get them in groups, uh, mess up the unity of the country, right. uh, promise them things that they can't afford for the state to give. And uh, in other words, they lack self-discipline and compassion. They, they're trying to, be, they're just greedy. <laughs> That's us, we're greedy. But if you have the self-discipline compassion, let's say it's morality, um, our founding fathers realized that if you have sufficient self-discipline and compassion, they knew that Morality was necessary, and I'd like to read a quote from George Washington because it's so darn important. It takes about, this is what uh, our government ought to read now. Of all the dispositions and habits which lead to political prosperity, religion and morals are indispensable supports. Let us with caution indulge the supposition that morality can be maintained without religion. Whatever may be conceded to the influence of refined education on minds of peculiar stature, both reason and experience forbid us to expect that national morality can prevail in exclusion of religious principle. When I came home, after all the meditation on things like that, realizing that compassion and self-discipline are indispensable to a democracy and that the only source of that kind of morality comes from religion where your life, your eternal life, depends on whether you love your neighbor as you love yourself, which is just compassion. 
we've thrown that out now, subtly, or by a period uh, of ju judicial and, 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 and legislative following the judicial rulings based on nothing, that you can't have the Ten Commandments in a school because the kids might look at the Ten Commandments and, and start thinking about them. Well, that country was built on that. Our founding fathers recognized that God, this nation was based on God. And William Penn said it as well as any, men must choose to be governed by God or condemn themselves to be ruled by tyrants. <laughs> Why, well, what happened to those statements which founded this country? We've let, we soft people enjoying the consumption of what the previous good principles have produced in a way of a system, blessed by God, and we respecting Him. Think of the Founding Fathers. They came over from a nation where they'd been persecuted from before. They crossed a hazardous ocean. They landed on a hostile shore with Indians in the climate. They, like POWs or any other soldiers, suffered. They knew about the reality of God. <laughs> and they were able to be formed into a, a, a nation which was de knowingly dependent upon God. <laughs> uh, there were numerous references to God. And, and in, in addition, the system was, it, it, it was a greater revolution than that. It said, all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Never before. It was God, king, divine right of kings, then the people. God, the revolution says, man, individual man, then government, the servant of the people. And they invented a system to do that. And it worked beautifully for a long time. And starting in about after 1950, the, the premise was questioned. And now, instead of being one nation under God, we are conscientiously and formally and officially one nation without God. And we're wondering why we're having problems. We haven't seen any problems yet unless this reverses. I want to talk about how you, as an outgrowth of your faith and this conviction and this understanding of freedom, when given the opportunity to go before the cameras and during your interrogation as a POW, you did something extraordinary. And I have tape of that. I want you to look at this and tell me what you're doing here. This is during an interrogation, a television interview. Well, uh, three days ago, they hit me for confession. I'd been charged an unconscious number of times. I gave them what I hope was a not credible convention, a convention. Then they told me, set me up on the top of two stools placed on top of each other and told me they were going to do this to me, in, have me interviewed, and I was to uh, <laughs> condemn my government. Right. But uh, the blinking Reiser and I, yeah, well, Reiser and I prayed about what I should do. Should I just refuse to go to the interview or go and try to blow it up? And the chances of that working were a million to one because I go there and I defy them and, and then they burn the tape and torture me some more. But I decided to try that, okay? And I got there and they entered the room and as they came in, there were these lights like that. And I said, ah, in case they change the words that I intend to say, I'm gonna bleak the word torture to prove that they at least had to torture me to get me here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then when he asked me the questions, uh, I, he, they asked me twice, uh, the key sentence being, what do you think of the policy of your government in Vietnam? The first time I said, I don't know what the policy of my government is because the only sources of news I have are North Vietnamese. Mm. But whatever the policy of my government is, I support it and I will support it as long as I live. Mm -hmm. They asked me another time and I said, I don't, the same thing about I don't know what the policy is now, but whatever, but I am a member of that government mm -hmm. and it is my job to support it and I will support it as long as I live. Mm. Well, I thought when they dragged me out of there, <laughs> that nobody was ever going to see that. And I was going to get hurt pretty bad. Mm -hmm. I was hurt pretty bad. The worst torture I ever got after that. But uh, by the grace of God, that Japanese photographer who had been having such interviews and, and, and taping tortured confessions knew he had a big scoop. Mm -hmm. He sneaked out of Hanoi that night, went back to Tokyo and auctioned it off. The first uh, bidder was ABC for 50 grand. Mm -hmm. and. I didn't learn until three days before I was released that when Red McDaniel, who was in that movie you just showed, uh, he was one of the two shown, mm -hmm. uh, told me uh, that he had seen it. I didn't know how much they'd seen it. I got him. Right. I didn't know how, how, that a lot of people had seen it. Right, and Navy and Intelligence read torture. I was so grateful to God yeah. that was the most great, yeah, they read the torture, but I believe they knew guys were already being tortured by the mm -hmm. fact that some were confession. I was not proud of that, I was proud that I defied them. That's what, when the Navy gave me the tape of that, they said, Denton, not only 
blink the word torture. He defied the North Vietnamese. Mm. I'm glad God gave me the grace to do that. <laughs> <laughs> now, once you and your fellow POWs were liberated, you were chosen to speak on their behalf. Here's what you no, had to say. No, I wasn't say. chosen. I was a senior officer on the first plane to land. That's why I okay. spoke. Well, here's what you had to say. I was chosen to take the rest of them home after that to Hawaii and the West Coast. Right. Here's what you had to say on February 12, 1972, when you arrived at Clark Air Force Base. 1973. I, I got that wrong in the tape. It's 1973. We've had the opportunity to save our country under difficult circumstances. We are profoundly grateful to our commander in chief and to our nation for this day. God bless America. God bless America. Admiral Denton, what should people know? What should they take from this experience you went through? Well, again, let's go to veterans. Lexington and Concord, the Battle of New Orleans, Chateau Thierry, D-Day. Mm -hmm. Korea, Vietnam, the Gulf War, Kosovo. They're talking about veterans' absentee ballots coming into Florida now. Mm -hmm. They burned them. Uh, it was another story, but they have disposed of those before. I hope to God somebody is watching over those because those men deserve to have their votes counted. Mm -hmm. And this has been circulated on the Internet vis-a-vis uh, -vis this election and these guys who voted. Remember, it is the soldier and the sailor, not the reporter, who has given us freedom of the press. It is the soldier and the sailor, not the poet, who has given us freedom of speech. It is the soldier and the sailor, not the campus organizer, who has given us the freedom to demonstrate. It is the soldier and the sailor who salutes the flag, who serves beneath the flag, whose coffin is draped by the flag, who allows the protester to burn the flag. What is the message you would give people? What should they remember as a result of this interview and your experience? Semper Fidelis, always faithful. May God bless all those men and women who serve and fight for us all over the globe. That's all the time we have for now. Until next week, the show continues on Facebook and Twitter. Like me on Facebook, follow me on Twitter. The links are at RaymondArroyo.com.